Now, my remit is actually just to talk about echocardiography uh, in this setting. Um, and uh, Uda did um, uh, set me quite a task to try and tell you about echo um, on both TAVI and Mitroclips before you actually have the session um, to tell you about the technologies themselves. So those things uh, are slightly backwards in that sense that you will actually get to learn more about the technologies afterwards. But I'll cover the echo aspects. Um, just to talk about TAVI in the first instance, um, you probably, a lot of you are aware of um, Medtronic and Edward Sapiens vials. There are two types of TAVIs, basically. Um, the Medtronic have developed a, a self-expanding uh, core valve, which is uh, used from a transfemoral approach. Edwards have uh, developed a, a balloon expanded valve, which can be used both from the transfemoral approach and the transapical approach. Um, my personal experiences with the uh, core valve, because Withenshaw have done a, a mainly a core valve um, center, uh, we've done um, sort of well over 100 cases now, but um, uh, can't profess to have the same sort of experiences as um, uh, Michael, um, who's done a lot more, but uh, we, have, uh, we are gaining experience as we speak. Um, now, I'd also like to acknowledge that um, imaging is not all based on echo. Um, there are um, other rapidly evolving um, and very uh, uh, amazing imaging, imaging technologies that are um, coming up uh, to speed, um, particularly cardiac CT that can actually look very well at the extra cardiac side of um, TAVI, so the aorta, the coronaries, etc. And also cardiac MR, which, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, I hope you can see this okay from the back. Can you? Okay. Um, this is a, a quadricuspid uh, aortic valve picked up on MR that ECHO actually couldn't pick up very easily. Um, saying, uh, talking about those um, uh, is not the remit of this particular lecture, but um, uh, going back to ECHO, I'll, I'll deal with it in a sort of logical way to look at patient selection, uh, to look at the periprocedural support um, as far as ECHO is concerned, and look at the postprocedural assessment of, uh, of patients. ECHO, unlike CT and cardiac MR, and I have a feeling that CT and cardiac MR will actually usurp ECHO in some of the roles of ECHO, um, but it will never actually come into the cath lab with you. Um, so ECHO will remain the, the major player in the periprocedural support. Um, but to start with preprocedural assessment and patient selection, well, you wouldn't really want to put um, a, a TAVI patient on the table without ensuring that they ha actually have got the severe disease that you think they have. And, and ECHO um, has been used uh, worldwide to, to look at severity of disease. And there are lots of hemodynamic um, assessments that can be done um, to, to identify the severe um, end of the aortic uh, disease spectrum. Um, these are fairly universally recognized, but unfortunately, um, as we see in a lot of um, our patients, they, it's actually quite difficult to fit our patients into those hemodynamic criteria. So uh, in this particular example, um, is this patient, has this patient actually got severe aortic stenosis, or is the um, aortic um, stenosis looking severe because of the um, left ventricular uh, impairment that, uh, that you can also see. Now, ECHO has a role in uh, trying to tease out those issues, um, and this is not standard resting ECHO, but this is uh, functional imaging with dibutamine, um, which can actually street tease out um, whether a valve really is severe when you get the ventricle going with, uh, with the inotrope, um, if the valve actually opens up better, um, then you're looking at pseudoaortic stenosis, which was looking awful because the ventricle was poor. On the other hand, if you um, increase the ventricular um, contractility and the valve really is fixed and tight, then you can work out the severity of that disease process because the valve doesn't open up with iontropes. Dibutamine stress echo can also be used, particularly in the TAVI group, because you have very, very poor ventricles in a lot of these cases. That's why they're surgical rejects in the first place. Um, and contractile reserve um, can actually be, in, be assessed uh, with dibutamine. And what people tend to look for is an increase in stroke volume from baseline with the inotrope, usually about 20 mics per kilogram per minute, um, of over 20% increase in stroke volume. 
once you've actually decided that this is um, a severe aortic patient um, who you are considering TAVI for, there are some echocardiographic determinants of whether TAVI is going to be um, the, 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 a suitable option. An aortic annulus actually plays quite a large part in this. Um, this determ it's, it's most important, the aortic annulus is most important because it de determines the size of the valve that you're going to put in. But it's not always easy. On the left-hand um, picture, you can see a nice, clean aortic valve, which is opening nicely. It's not stenosed. But you can, you can imagine that the annular measurements on this picture would be much, much easier than the annular measurements on this calcified valve, where you actually get a lot of drop, echo dropout. So where are you measuring from? Are you measuring? Um, uh, can you actually see what you're trying to measure? But the, the idea is that you, uh, the, you take multiple views and try and get the best fit, but you get the largest measurement that you've got from your views. Now, there is a move now to move away, because of all the constraints of 2D echocardiography, there is a move to move on to 3D echocardiography for this purpose alone, because there has been work done where um, we know that uh, from the 2D images, the long axis view, you actually undersize the aortic annulus because you don't actually get a true aortic annulus uh, measurement. And when you use three-dimensional echocardiography, you can actually cut the, th the echo in, in the annular plane and then do cross-sectional cross imaging similar to um, other modalities like CT or MR. But CT is also very, very useful in this context. But the annular sizing is really crucial because, as I say, uh, you can size your pr uh, prosthesis depending on this. And oh. Edwards and Corvalve have um, uh, various ranges of sizes that fit their various valves. They've both got three valves, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, three valve sizes. But essentially, um, the Edwards valve has a smaller um, um, size and the core valve can now go above uh, 27 millimeters with their 31 millimeter um, valve size. So um, when you do measure, when you're happy with your views and you can see all the uh, annulus pro properly, you look at the hinge point of the aortic leaflets, and if there's calcium associated with it, you go beyond the calcium, so you go on the outer edges of the calcium at the annulus. And in this particular case, a 21 millimeter um, annulus, you could fit either uh, an Edwards valve, the smaller Edwards valve, or um, the smaller core valve. <coughs> Um, once you know that the uh, annulus is of a size that you can actually fit a, fit a, a valve into, you do need to look at the valve morphology. Um, and this is important, particularly if you're starting up a program, because I, I don't think uh, a bicuspid valve is for startups. Um, a nice tricuspid valve will allow wires, etc., to go through the middle of the valve, which is where the opening usually is. It's a central opening. But the orifice is very eccentric in a bicuspid valve, as you can see on the right-hand side, right side of your screen. And, it, and the wire can be very, sitting very, very eccentrically. And if the wire is sitting very eccentrically, um, getting transaxial uh, with the valve and the aorta is actually very, very difficult. Um, and we know that um, when you do bicuspid aortic valves, this is actually a tricuspid valve that's had a core valve put in. You can see a nice circular um, core valve deployment. But with a bicuspid valve, you can end up with um, rather odd elliptical-shaped um, uh, deployments that you have to post-dilate, et cetera, if you're brave enough. Um, so bicuspid valves, not for the starters, um, and can be very difficult. But calcium really is the big bugbear of, um, of the transcatheter um, valve world. Um, and there's good reason for that. Uh, I mean, th these are two examples of bicuspid valves. Here's a bicuspid valve which actually doesn't have that much calcium in it, and it's a good type of bicuspid valve. And when you put a core valve in, for example, you get a nice circular uh, deployment. Here's a bicuspid valve, which actually is very calcified. You'll have to take it from me that it is a bicuspid valve. Um, and you can actually get, end up with a quite a, a, a deformed-looking um, deployment, uh, deployed transcatheter uh, valve. So bicuspid valves and calcium don't go together particularly well. Um, now, here's some calcium that we um, saw at the beginning of a case, um, just sort of on the LV outflow tract um, side of the annulus. And here's the calcium um, after the core valve was put in. You can actually see that the core valve um, has lifted off this calcium, and it's looking rather ominous and mobile. And there are case reports in the literature of fatalities, unfortunately, um, 
uh, with uh, calcium flying down coronary arteries and, and um, um, the outcome therefore uh, is very poor there. So calcium is, is something to really watch out for and warn your um, interventionists about. Um, calcium can also, for obvious reasons, because you're squashing calcium um, against the wall, calcium can leave rather, rather large gaps. So you can end up with either a good outcome in a valve that hasn't got that much calcium in or, or a, a worse outcome with lots more aortic regurgitation in the post-procedure um, transthoracic echo and the post-procedure TOE. Coronary ostea and the relationship to the annulus is actually important, particularly for the Edwards valve. The design of these valves, which I'm hoping that you'll hear over the course of the day, is such that uh, the Edwards valve basically sits in the annulus of the, um, uh, of the aortic valve, whereas the core valve is a, a, is a longer structure and the, the bottom end of it, the skirt of it, does sit against the annulus. The, there is a waste built into the core valve which allow, allows... Um, coronary blood flow uh, to go uh, unimpeded. So the, with the core valve, the coronary blood, supply, it, coronary blood supply is not so much in jeopardy as is with an Edwards valve. And, and the bigger the Edwards valve is, the, the larger the height of the Edwards valve, so the, long, the, the more likely you are to get um, the coronary uh, osteo obstructed. So you do have to be careful about larger Edwards valves in particular. There are other considerations that you pick up from a, your pre-procedural TOE uh, to guide your um, operators. You wouldn't want your uh, interventional colleagues to go through um, this in the descending aorta. This is a grade uh, four atheromatous plaque, which is um, obviously sort of just waiting uh, to fly off in the, in the wrong direction. Um, you also wouldn't want your interventional colleagues to poke around um, into a left ventricle with uh, a, a mural thrombus like this. Um, so there are other um, areas you know, outside of the heart and inside that you have to look at to um, talk to your interventional colleagues about. Now, there are some other criteria. Both Edwards and Medtronic have actually... Um, set out quite nice criteria that you can, there's a massive checklist from both companies that you can go through. So, for example, the size of the aorta is one of them, the angle between the left ventricular um, um, outflow and, and the sigmoid septum, for example, is another one. So there are some do's and don'ts in the, on the checklist that, uh, that you know, uh, you'll have access to from the web. So, moving on to... Um, perioperative um, uh, support where I think TOE is, is most useful. Um, firstly, I'm really pleased uh, that both these companies recognize that ECHO is a big player in the perioperative setting and therefore they have made their equipment visible not only to fluoroscopy but also to ECHO. So, these wires, for example, and balloons, this balloon doesn't look particularly happy, but balloons are actually easily seen and recognisable on um, TOE particularly. Uh, I, I, I have heard in the room that transthoracic uh, is also used, and I'd be interested to see what Michael has to say about um, echogenicity um, from the transthoracic approach, but we use TE and they are very easily seen, which is extremely important. So once you actually embark on a TAVI procedure, and these are core valve images, um, the positioning of the core valve and the positioning of the Edwards valve is the next vital step. And that's where echo really um, is useful. This um, procedure is, a lot of it is still fluoroscopy based. Um, I, you know, it's not like the mitral clip. The mitral clip is very much echo based, but the TAVI procedures, a lot of it is still fluoroscopy based, but the initial positioning uh, before you commit the valve as such uh, is actually quite important from echo. So here you can see that there's a guide catheter and most of the core valve is actually inside the delivery system, but the distal end, the, the LV end, has actually started to come out now and you can just see the um, mesh um, uh, opening up slightly and this is about a third uh, deployment. And at this third it's actually vital to see that it's not impinging the mitral uh, apparatus and it is actually covering the area that you need to cover, which is um, the aortic uh, valve hinge points. Um, so it needs to be 
underneath the annulus but cover the calcium that you're likely to uh, encounter there. Now, that positioning is important with colour as well, so you actually see whether you are going to leave the valve uh, exposed to a lot of paravalvular AR, and indeed you're going to actually cause problems with mitral regurgitation. Once you're happy with the positioning um, on fluoroscopy as well as echo, and fluoroscopy unfortunately is a very two-dimensional picture, whereas an echo, very quickly you can go around various views, you can do cross-sectional imaging with 3D echo, uh, and look at the positioning from different angles because the valves are not all textbook sitting in one plane. Um, but once you're happy, the rest of the procedure really is um, fluoroscopy-led because once a, about a third of the core valve actually comes out of the delivery system, you kind of committed. Once it anchors against the annulus, you're committed and you, you hit a point of no return where even if you tell them, tell your uh, interventional colleagues that it's not looking pretty, they're actually committed to delivering the system and they may have to do post-procedural um, things like putting another, another valve in valve or, or post-dilatation, but there is a point of no return beyond about the first third of the valve. Um, so it's fluoroscopy-led and more and more of the core valve is let out of the delivery system until finally you have the end result there. Uh, that, incidentally, is a, a Star Edwards valve. Um, Going on to the post-procedural assess assessment, you do obviously do um, all of your sort of checks at the time, um, and this is where you have to work closely with your anaesthetist because one of the main things that you're going to be looking for um, is aortic regurgitation. How much residual aortic regurgitation have you been left with? But if the hemodynamics, just like surgeons and anaesthetists talk sometimes, um, after uh, repairs and valve uh, uh, procedures, um, once you, what, when you want to actually check four regurgitant jets like this, you have to get the hemodynamics ideal. So if the patient is underfilled, um, you know, you have to fill them up. If the blood pressure is low, you, you actually have to increase the blood pressure, otherwise your assessments are going to be invalid. Um, so once you're happy with the dynamics, uh, hemodynamic status, you do look for AR. In this particular case, you've actually got quite a lot of paravalvular AR. Uh, and you've got some under-deployment of the um, core valve. So in, in this case, they had a better result with post-dilatation, uh, which is putting another balloon inside the valve and dilating it. Um, echo is also extremely important um, as the days progress post-procedure and when um, your patients are not doing so well. So in this particular patient, he came out into the recovery area in the, of the cath lab um, and started developing um, uh, major hypotension and shock. Uh, and a transthoracic echo, which is the quickest thing to do in, a, in a, an awake patient, was done, uh, which showed that the, um, uh, the TAVI had actually migrated into the left ventricle. So these complications, again, are, are very much echo-based um, uh, in terms of the assessments. Uh, so, just to summarize TAVI before I move on very briefly to MitroClip, um, ECHO is used mainly for patient selection, as is other imaging modalities. TAVI positioning is the main, main thing that you do in the perioperative setting, and ECHO really is the only option for that. And the complications, it's certainly first line uh, for your complications when you're looking particularly for uh, my, uh, you know, migration of movement of the uh, core valves and uh, residual aortic regurgitation. If I may move on to MitroClips. Um, MitroClip is a very different beast. It's echo-led from start to finish. Um, and, um, I mean, it's a very... Mitral valves, as you all know, is, is extremely complex, and it's not really something I can cover comprehensively, but I'll give you a flavor of what the MitroClip procedure is all about uh, from an echo perspective. Basically, for the, for the, peop for the uninitiated, uh, a mitroclip um, is based on the old Alfieri stitch uh, procedure um, uh, using the same principles that if you um, stitch up um, your P2 and A2 segments in this particular case uh, across the middle, then uh, you will be able to abolish uh, mitral regurgitation, particularly if they're central jets. Uh, and the clip uh, is at the end of a, a delivery system which is steerable um, uh, uh, and you basically hunt for the jet, you put the clip in where the jet is most prominent and then um, there are some nuances to the procedure that you can actually grasp both leaflets 
and then you can unclip the delivery system. I'm making it very simplified. It's not this simple. Um, unclip the delivery system, um, and you're left with a clip in, in situ. So that's the sort of um, overall view of the clip. Now, um, the um, Everest trials uh, for the mitral procedures, which uh, I think uh, Dr. Butch will cover later on, um, will uh, have actually given us a lot of insight into what uh, patients are suitable uh, in terms of patient, patient selection uh, for the mitral clip procedure. And basically, uh, degenerative valves are suitable, as are uh, ischemic or functional valves, valve pathologies. But common sense applies that if the clip arms are about 7 millimeters on either side, the overall stretch of the clip is about 1.4, 1.5 uh, centimeters, so you're not going to be able to grasp edges of leaflets that are more than 1.5 centimeters apart. And so um, the flail gap, in, in, this, in the Everest trials, they actually suggest one, one centimeter, but I know up and down the country, people that are doing high volume clip work, uh, not so much in this country at the moment with the funding uh, disappearing, but um, uh, people that, ha that are uh, further up in their, tra their learning curve can actually go up uh, to a stretch of about 1.5 um, centimetres. But there are other um, uh, sort of nuances of the clip um, which make, make it difficult to actually get the clip in place. So if the um, steerability uh, is difficult, then you're not actually going to be able to reach down to the mitral clip. So from TOE, you work out, um, f when you're doing your transeptal puncture, you actually work out where to puncture the septum in a very targeted way, which is very different to any EP punctures that are done, which are basically shoved through the septum. Um, this, is ha this has to be done in a very targeted way, so you've got enough working space to actually steer the mitral clip onto the mitral valve. And that usually is about 3.5 centimeters to where your um, catheter is pointing the septum. Uh, and if you've got a very deep co-optation, um, then you, know, you, have, you have problems actually getting the valve in. You may have to go a little bit lower down. Um, so steerability and the actual flail gaps are the most important sort of selection criteria. Again, echogenicity wise, uh, these are exquisitely visible on echo. You can actually see on 3D echo as well as 2D echo, you can see the different coils of, of this dilator. You can actually see um, tram track sort of um, lumens. Um, this particular lumen is empty uh, of the guide catheter. Uh, and you can actually see things coming out of it. And this, this can all be live. So. Um, it's, 3D echo particularly is actually a, a beautiful live modality to steer your, uh, the brain of your interventional colleagues and your own brain actually as to where you're going. Um, but basically this is uh, back to 2D. The companies still work with 2D mainly. They, they haven't actually got their brain around uh, 3D as yet. But this is a, a mitral clip sort of approaching the mitral valve, getting a bit closer. And then finally getting close enough to open up the arms. So these are all easy to see on echocardiography. Now 3D echo has a, an additional advantage to 2D echo because you can actually um, look at it from a surgeon's eye view. So this is a surgeon's eye view that most surgeons will recognize with the anterior leaflet up here and the posterior leaflet down there. And, and we're aiming for a central jet um, and the 3D, when the clip arms are actually open, in this particular um, uh, uh, instant of this, of this procedure, the arms are not particularly perpendicular across the coarptation line, but you can steer it again live, and you can actually get the arms perfectly perpendicular to the area, the area of interest uh, before you actually start grasping. Mm -hmm. Grasping is usually done on 2D, because uh, I don't think resolution is good enough. Okay. So here's a clip uh, in its final position um, and with reduction of uh, mitral vegetation. So I'm going to finish there um, and leave you uh, with one of my favorite um, images where a core valve um, balloon plasty uh, prior to a core valve is being done in a, in a patient with, that you've already seen the fluoroscopy pictures of, the Star Edwards valve. 
As you can see, it's done under rapid pacing, so the balloon is stable. And as the balloon goes up, this is the balloon going up, full of, filling up with sort of air bubbles and, and uh, liquid. Uh, the the uh, Star Edwards valve just stops working completely, uh, and the stasis that develops in the left atrium is phenomenal, really. The patient was fine, by the way, no cerebral emboli. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent talk. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Any burning questions, people? Michael. Um, have you guys done any cabin procedures for low gradient, low, low aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, or is that still under the realm? No, we, we have. Very challenging patients to diagnose. Yeah, they are. We, we do do them. Um, we have a very um, active stress echo service, uh, and we use. Stress echo, we use CMR to look, for, look at um, contractile reserve in those patients. And if you're happy that the contractile reserve is there, um, with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, we do actually proceed to sorry, tell you. Um, sorry, I worded that incorrectly. Not for the patients with impaired ventricular function. The ones with All right. low flow, low gradient, but... Um, but normal LV. Normal LV. Those are really tricky patients. Yes, they are. Um, I'm not sure if we have actually done any of those, uh, to be honest, no. But the, the assessment, the echo assessment in those is very tricky, as you say. Um, if you, I mean, we use all the armamentarium that we have to make sure they are severe, but, um, cause, so we use MR, uh, we use TOE for them, uh, we make sure that their systemic blood pressures are not the cause for the low gradients. Uh, we make sure, you know, you've ruled out everything else like severe aortic regurgitation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we haven't actually offered them Metavias yet. Have you? No, no, no. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Okay.